or reading or hearing mainly because I heard them in person more than I saw them on videos or on tapes or books. But I used to love reading the testimonies of a lot of the born again Christians that I kind of grew up with because they always had such an interesting testimony. You know, it was so, well, put it bluntly, interesting. You know, most of the times, because it was the 60s and the 70s that these people got saved, the Jesus freaks that I know, you know, that were West Coast, you know, kind of phenomenon, although it happened around the world, and it was all happening in the same time as things were happening in Israel that were going on. That, you know, if you do a study between the two, you'll see that the Jesus movement was happening at the same time that God was moving in Israel. Interesting. But one of the fascinating things I always seemed to see was that You'd hear a testimony that says, I was on drugs and then I met Jesus, or I was a drug addict, or I was a murderer, or I was a killer, or I was, you know, like lost, or I was all these different bad things that you think of bad people doing, you know, kind of messed up, you know. All the messed up people were hippies, <laughs> you know, they were all drug addicts. I wasn't. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was terrified of hypodermics and scared of losing my mind, so I stayed away from drugs completely. And I was a hippie. And it was funny because the people that I knew that got saved were either doing some kind of drugs or, you know, in some way had given up something in order to get something. You know, they they got saved and delivered, key word being there, delivered from drugs or alcohol or, you know, abuse or, you know, something something really bad. You've heard those testimonies. They're always miraculous and wonderful and marvelous and stupendous. And you just go, wow, look at the difference. It was night and day. Well, my testimony was kind of like that. I went from being a good kid to, bam, the bottom falling out of my life. Really. <laughs> it was like, man, I got saved and all hell broke loose. Literally. Which is why I really enjoyed the devotional today, because <laughs> it kind of reminds me of me. <laughs> it was like, wow, what the hell happened? <laughs> Even my mother said that, you know, one time. She was kind of smarting off, you know, before she died, and it was a while back. But anyways, she kind of said the same thing, you know, you were such a good kid, nothing ever happened to you. You were just such a good kid, and then you got saved, you know, and bam, everything went to pieces. Sort of, you know. Because you see, it's rather humorous that when I got saved, I basically had no issues, you know. I didn't have any problems, you know. I grew up kind of a dull lifestyle, you know. Kind of a boring wallflower kid. You know, I was the only long hair in a town of short hairs, which was like, you know, the only hippie in Norco, <laughs> which meant, you know, until... I got into high school, there were no other hippies. When I was in junior high, I was the only one. Then gradually, all these other hippies seemed to either come to Norco or they grew up into becoming hippies. I was one of the, I, was, I know I was the first one because people used to come over my door and try to talk my mother into going to get me a haircut. Matter of fact, in junior high, the school caught me in the corner of a field. You know, everybody had gotten out in the field and they pinned me down and cut some of my hair. I remember that. <laughs> Woo, that was scary. But the point is, when I got saved, it was 1974, you know, and it was like, wow, you know, and I was lonely because I always felt like, you know, the odd man out, and I was the only child in the family of four is how I grew up, and just all kinds of things. But I wasn't into drugs or anything like that. But I was lonely, you know, so when I got saved, you know, it was like an emotional thing, just like most Jesus people did in those days, you know, it was like, wow, one moment, phew, the next minute, phew, you know, one of those phenomenal experiences. I mean, I was like all over the place. And it was funny because not long after that, about 40 days, just about exactly, I was in Corona, California of all places, and somewhere in the upper, kind of like on the backside over the orange groves, you know, not quite to the orange groves, which are gone, but you know, where Corona is, and it was in one of the neighborhoods, and there was a door that was carved with all this Jesus freak stuff, you know, on it. And, I don't know how I got there, but, you know, there's a home Bible study going on, and there wasn't that many people in there, but apparently they were praying for me because one minute I was, like, you know, sitting there in a 
little circle, you know, with a home Bible study. Next man, I was bam! Speaking in tongues and speaking things I didn't even know what I was saying. Well, actually, I had the gift of interpretation at the time, so, yeah, I knew what I was saying. But I had no idea what was going on. I was just, like, blasted again by something. I had no clue what it was. It was like, my eyes would big around in saucers, my mouth was working overtime, and it was like, wow, things were happening there. <laughs> Boy, can I tell you, when it comes to emotions, I had all of the ones that you could ever imagine anyone ever having, and more so. I was not over the top. I wasn't out in left field. I was outside the bleachers. <laughs> I was gone outside the stadium. Michael had flown the coop. Matter of fact, it was so miraculous that, man, you know, Mama's little virgin here would have been definitely one of the 144,000, so to speak. <laughs> Woo! I was all over the place. But you see, it was interesting too because even though that phenomenal experience, and I didn't know the timing until later, and then I realized, wow, it was 40 days, you know, that right after that, not shortly thereafter, I had already signed up for the Marine Corps before I ever got saved. I was in boot camp. Whoa, what am I doing in boot camp? What's a good kid like you doing in a place like this, heading for Vietnam? Because I had volunteered. <laughs> those days you got drafted. You know, It wasn't like a wonderful thing where you're serving your country. Although in those days, because we grew up with Leon Uris and Battle Cry, and we used to watch combat you know, on television and think of our America as being right no matter what, even if it was wrong. You know, kind of like brainwashed, you know. Did come out in the wash like nowadays it does, but here I am in boot camp getting ready to go to Vietnam, you know, and wow, the word says get up and get out. And I went, uh, I don't think so. And it was God speaking to me, and it was very clear, very obvious, very powerful move of the Holy Spirit, you know, and it was like, uh, that's not really one of those trials you want to go through, you know. And so it was like, whoa, this isn't anything like I was told that it was going to happen, you know. Campus Crusade was Christ, was inside the Marine Corps. What's a Marine Corps having with Campus Crusade for Christ on Sunday? Interesting. Boot camp. And so I was blown away. It was like, is this any way Billy Graham started? So I kind of was wondering, like, wow, man, you know, all my other contemporaries, I wonder if they're going to do the same thing I'm going through. I found out later, no, of course. You know, they got saved, was in the church, and grew up and became pastors, evangelists, whatever they are. Now, me, man, I'm like the opposite. Like, things are falling apart quickly. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh wow, my guts are falling apart. And then I'm like dying and I'm thrown into Babel and Abel Hospital. Less than one year after I got saved, my world fell apart. And I'm standing on the edge of Balboa and Abel balcony ready to kill myself. I felt like Jesus standing on the temple, you know, and Satan saying to him, here's all the kingdoms of the world if you just bow down and worship me. Well, I didn't want to bow down and worship. I was ready to give up on God, give up on the Holy Spirit, give up on all the stuff that had happened to me, give up on the... The Word of God, give up on Jesus, give up on life, give up on everything because I couldn't be a Marine and by golly they were drumming me out of the service and they were moving their paperwork and maneuvering it so that I was being given a barely lucky for me, you know, according to what they were saying, you know, honorable discharge, you know, and that they would take care of my health issues if I had any for life. Yeah, right. You just try that one on for size. Good luck with your military benefits, old G.I. Joes. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen the way you think it is. And so Less than a year after I got saved, all hell had broken loose. Things fell apart. Things had gone to pieces. Things had gone out of my way. And even worse, they drummed me out of the service. And then I was out in the desert of my life, out alone with God, trying to figure out what the hell happened. And I hadn't even been to Big Calvary yet. <laughs> that was interesting. I went through getting saved at maybe Calvary Riverside and less than a year later, being in the Marine Corps and out of the Marine Corps and then back to Norco and then out of Norco to Modesto for about a year before I wound up in Big Calvary and got grounded in the Word. But the interesting thing of it is, is that my salvation experience reminds me of what we're reading about in Streets in the Desert today. Because it was almost as though God, when He decided to take my life under control, decided to wiped me out after giving me the Holy Spirit and led me for 40 maybe years in the wilderness which by the way next year is my 40th year <laughs> woohoo I'm expecting big things I'm expecting big things no I'm not 
not. But be 40 years as a Christian come next year. Or maybe this summer, I'm not sure which. Kind of in between. I think it's next year. But having said that, I remember being put through some challenging ways and places that blew me away. Even until the day I finally made it back to Calvary, you know, and I was starving and hungry and just like, man, you know, what went on with all that? And the reality of what God had done was that he had taken me to an experience similar to what he did with his son. Maybe it's kind of the same as what he did with you, kind of what he's doing to you. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Luke 4, 1 and 2. Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost, and yet he was tempted. Temptation often comes from a man, comes upon a man when its strongest power, when he is nearest to God. As someone has said, the devil aims high. He got one apostle to say he did not even know Jesus. Very few men have such conflicts with the devil as Martin Luther had. Why? Because Martin Luther was going to shake the very kingdom of hell. Oh, what conflicts John Bunyan had. If a man has much of the Spirit of God, he will have great conflicts with the tempter and temptation. God permits temptation because it does for us what the storms do for the oaks. It roots us, and what the fire does for the paintings on the porcelain, it makes them permanent and glazes us. You never know that you have a grip on Jesus or that he has a grip on you, as well as when the devil is using all his force to attract you from him. Then you feel the pull of Jesus' right hand telling you, no, don't go that way. And if you do, you feel so much remorse you want to go back as fast as you can. Extraordinary afflictions are not always the punishment of extraordinary sins, but sometimes the trial of extraordinary graces. God hath many sharp cutting instruments and rough files for the polishing of his jewels, and those he carefully loves and means to make the most resplendent, he has often to use his tools upon them so. I bear my willing witness that I owe more to the fire and the hammer and the file than to anything else in my Lord's workshop. I sometimes question whether I've ever learned anything except through the rod. When my schoolroom is darkened, I see most. Spurgeon. And you know, maybe like you, maybe like me, we learn our best lessons when we're tried and tempted rather than when we're blessed and at rest. Because I see more of those that are contented when I think that they should probably be worried about how they've been blessed and where they're headed for with that contentment they seem to be at rest with rather than the rest of us who may be going through the challenges. Because one of the benefits that there is in poverty is it isolates you into the focal point of who you depend on for all your prosperity. And when you're prosperous, unfortunately, the opposite is true. You're less likely to focus in on the person who's made you that way as you are about the things that you have in the way. Be careful. God may be leading you in the way he wants you to go, and that the way he wants you to learn isn't through the gentle school of let's have a home Bible study and everything's going to be hunky-dory, but rather he may take you out into the desert and cause you to suffer and to go through it so that you'll be able to do it all the way through to the end.